Hello and welcome to a Tell Us Tales podcast. This is Chris's Corner. I'm your host Chris Taylor and welcome back to a brand new episode. This week I'll be talking about, it's of course, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Something that I've read twice now, a book that is known as the granddaddy, the foundation of personal finance. Uh, it's been around for 20 plus years now. It has a gold star standard for being able to provide the best, most simplest advice there is. And Albert Einstein said, if you can't explain something simply, then you don't truly understand it. And I stick to that when it comes down to a book that can explain something as not too complex, but complex and boring enough for us all to fall asleep a little bit when it comes down to finances uh, and how to become rich or wealthy or whatever you want to call it. It's a brilliant book. I genuinely think that everyone who wants to understand finance and understand the value of money uh, should give it a go. Or if you just want to learn how to increase your value as a person or increase your value uh, in your bank account, then this is the book for you. And in this podcast, literally all I'm going to do is give up, give a couple of really key points that this book uh, can provide you, what it can give you, and how you're going to learn something. So first, number one, let's get the big one out of the way. Something that I hear nonstop from all of my parents' generation that is the biggest, fattest lie ever told, and something that I had a feeling was a lie when I was younger, I always, I, I, you know, when you have something that sort of sticks at the back of your mind, it doesn't quite make sense to you, is something that this book clarified. And that is, having a mortgage and owning a house is not, I repeat, is not an asset. It is a liability. Unless you are getting cash flow, cash in hand, or some sort of cash being sent back to you via dividends or uh, interest or um, rent or any of these things, unless it's real estate being providing you cash flow, it is a liability. If it is purely providing you with expenses, what, when, what do I mean by that? I mean, if money is coming out of your account and not coming in, that is a liability. If a cost is happening and there is no income, that means it is not an asset. It is a liability. The defin the like the key definition within this book of learning what an asset is and what's a liability is key. And that example there that I've just given you, that's probably 20 years worth of finance within one sentence. A asset is something that gives you money and an liability is something that takes money from you. It's that simple. If you can understand that and understand that owning a car, owning a house, owning MacBooks and watches and all of these things, unless they are providing you with money and you're selling them and getting money back from them off the original value, getting a profit, making cash flow, (laughs) they're a liability and get rid of them. I uh, No, I shouldn't say that. That's your lifestyle. You make choices. But my point to this is this. You're told at a very early age that one of the first things you should try to do when you're older is to own your own home. Now, I'm not against that. What I am against is young people getting into 20 to 30 plus year mortgages and therefore selling their future to pay for now. And that is what's happening. It's continued to happen. It's always been happening. And somehow we just let it slide. We talk about all of these big things on the news constantly. And yet this is sludged under the rug. Just just, just chucked under there. Just for no reason whatsoever. This should be headline news. Headline news across the world. That I don't know the specific percentage. But I know it's a lot of people who have mortgages and who have homes. And I would love to know the percentage of people who cannot afford that and will go into debt trying to pay these loans. It's probably huge. It's probably as bad as the student loan crisis, but we won't get into that. So number one, under this book defines to you, if you didn't understand what I just said, then read this book and it will explain it even simpler than that of what an asset and what a liability is. And therefore, you can understand from there how to prioritize how you pay your bills, what you're spending your money on. That's another thing. What I didn't, what I realized very early on is 
how I can utilize my money. I've, I've always been relatively good at saving money. I've been lucky. I was taught by my parents very early on not to get into debt and not to get into serious owing people money I couldn't pay in the future. And that was a really key piece, not to spend money I didn't have on things that didn't have any value. Or to be patient, and if it was worth it, you could buy it. And if you wanted it that much, you can save for it, and that makes it that much more special. That's another point that, uh, literally, that Robert makes in this book. He talks about how his wife wanted a Porsche. Now, many people want Porsches. That's great. But what he defines here is that he takes the cash flow from one of his rental profit properties, and he waits three years for her, his and her portfolio to return enough cash flow and enough profit back for them to be able to buy that Porsche outright and not owe any money. Isn't that fantastic? And he talks about that most people will buy something that they can't afford and then they will start to resent that product. And I love that. I think that's so true. The amount of people who buy things they can't afford and then they start to look at it and think, oh, that thing has cost me this amount of money and now I can't go on holiday, and now I can't do this, and now I can't do that, and they start to think, oh, I wish I hadn't bought it in the first place. And then they'll return it, and blah, 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 and the whole process will be worthless. Or they can't return it, and they've lost the money. And here's here's the biggie here, is that Robert's wife appreciates that Porsche more than ever, because she was patient, she saved for it, she allowed her business to grow, her asset to grow, and it didn't decrease the value of it by taking out, taking some small profit from that cash flow to be able to therefore buy her Porsche. Now, I've just realized we're past the six minute mark. So for those who are still here, congratulations, you're part of the new group of the, the internet who have the patience to be able to get past that median point in the video. For those who've watched my previous video, you'll know that you're a special group of people who have the patience to be able to get past that period. So well done you, well done you, congratulate you, a round of applause. Well, I'll put a meme in there just for you. Uh, so that's your reward, little little marble in the, uh, in the jar. <laughs> <laughs> but um, apart from silly memes, what I do want to point out is patience is another thing that he, he, allu he doesn't specifically say this in the book, but I do think that it's a real key factor in there in the sense that you have to know that this is going to take some time to become wealthy. One of the key points that he does say is the, f the definition of a wealthy person. Now, the person who said it, he's quoting it, he's saying it, it is that a wealthy man is how long can he last without working? How much money does he have to be able to uh, allocate for the amount of days that he doesn't need to work? Now, this is quite relevant to me because I've just taken around 10 months off work. So it turns out I'm wealthy enough to say that taking a year out is wealthy. And to me, I consider that extremely grateful to be able to take that amount of time off. Extremely grateful to say that I got to travel to do new countries and will continue to travel new countries until I start a new role, which is fantastic. This is wealth. The ability to not work and have the funds to be able to survive. That is true wealth. Now you may say, Chris, that's a cop out. That's not wealthy. I wanna be able to splash on cash on cars. Wealth is different for each person. Every person has a different, diff like a different definition of what they see as wealthy, but this is a clear definition of what you can pinpoint to everybody can be wealthy. How long can you last without working? How long can you go without a paycheck? This is true wealth. And if you're in your mid-twenties, which most of my listeners or, or viewers are, you'll understand that this is true wealth because your time is valuable, super valuable. Most people say they, they don't have time to travel or try time to do things until they've retired, but we don't want to have to wait till then. If you work hard, maybe you can even get that time in your thirties. And that's the goal, isn't it? When you're prime time, when, you're, when you've got that energy, when you've got that time to be able to do these things, you don't want to have to wait until the end of retirement to be able to say, ah, now I'm going to do all the things I wanted to do. When you're old and unable to functionally do the things that you want to functionally do. 
Now, I'm not knocking old people or anything on those lines. If you, if you want to wait until you're 65 to retire and do all this, uh, good for you. That, that's great. But if you want to do more and be able to have more days where you don't have to work, this these points will really sit home for you. And I really, if you are listening to this and you are hearing this, this is from a man who's just done what I've said. Like I've taken time off. I've taken and I've been able to travel and spend money and go traveling the world and do things I really want to do within that period of time. So, you know, it, it, it is practical advice here. It's not just me giving you theories, you know, like some of those professors that you hear about uh, talking or, or, or uh, um, actually... That's a can of worms I'm not going to get into. Anyway, more points on this book. And I'm going to keep this to a 30-minute podcast so that you're not blown by finances and falling asleep halfway. Robert talks about how, when he was younger, he had a, a dad who was a professor and lived the poor dad mindset. Now, Robert's dad wasn't a poor man by any sense of the word. He had an income that was quite high and it would like potentially keep him at a relatively high standard. That was great for him, but he didn't understand how to do finances. Now, this is really interesting to see. I don't see it. I, I th actually, I think my dad's quite good at finances, so I, I can't relate on that scale. But he does have the contrast of his rich dad, who is his best friend's father, who gives this good advice, who gives this idea that instead of working for the company, and climbing the ladder you should own the ladder and he makes the phrase mind your own business repetitively throughout the book mind your own business is a fantastic phrase so he's not telling you to quit your job and never work again the point in this book is that you can build your own business while you're working while you're doing your full-time job while you've got kids while you've got wife got why you've got all of these things the earlier, uh, earlier you do it, the easier it is. So for, the, for those who I talked about earlier, who are the majority between the age of 20 to 30, this is your time. This is your period of time to be able to utilize a great way to be able to maximize your 30s, 40s, and 50s. 30 years of period of time. You're gonna maximize that by not burning the candle at both ends, but by understanding that you can build your own business in your free time while working that eight hour day shift, while doing the job that you're not too keen, or, or maybe you're like me and you're lucky enough to enjoy both and you can do the, the day job and you can also do something else at the same time. So for me, I've got Taylor's Tales. Taylor's Tales is the business. It's both, a, you know, I'm writing my own book. I've got the podcast. I've got uh, potential YouTube videos, all of these things, extras on the side to be able to potentially monetize one day. You know, 10 years, 10, 30 years time, doesn't matter how long, you're willing to invest the time in that minding your own business. And this is the investment. This is the investment you make in yourself. So many people get to the old age and they say, damn, if I just started this, if I just started that, no. You say now. You say, I don't want regrets. I want to mind my own business. And this is it. If you can start your own business, all a corporation is, is literally just you sending a document to the government saying, I would like to set up a business. And all it is, is a piece of paper with your business's name on it. That's all it is. It's just officiation. And once you do start your own business, and maybe you start making some expenses, or maybe you start making some profit, then you can start playing the loopholes that come with it. And there you go. And then this book teaches you how to do it. <laughs> and and what well, I say teaches you, it tells you about some of the loopholes. It tells you about the fact that corporate tax is only 12.5% and the fact that you're paying more, much more than that when it comes down to income tax. You think about that. The more money you make when it comes down to being a corporate rat or in the rat race or anything like that, the more money you make, the more tax you pay. But when you own your own company, that's not the case at all. You can use expenses, you can use company time, you can use the corporate tax, you can use loopholes that come with the all, all of the benefits of owning your own company. And I, I get really excited about this, as you can tell, because it's all so new to me as well, because I only read this book back in 2020. And I've read, this is my second or, second or third time reading it again. And I, I genuinely think, for such a small book 
it's got so many lessons and Robert's a killer he's on YouTube you don't need uh, anyone to, to give him any more glory because he's he's covered himself in glory he's fantastic um, he's humble in how he talks about some things as well I love that he talks about in the book as well how money is nothing they print more of it every day this is really important in the sense that money is literally just a way to be able to trade it's it's worthless it's literally just made by the gov government as a way to be able to guarantee value uh, and it's the same as bitcoin it's the same as all of these things they have zero value i wish i could say that we were still using the gold standard and, and, and there was a physical value behind these things but there isn't not really not in the fiscal system and you should understand that that if you just put money in a savings account like these one percent savings accounts for stuff that you're looking to save long term you're literally just well you're losing money because of inflation alone inflation at the moment is 8.5 percent which means you are fighting an uphill battle sir if you don't have your money in the stock market right now even though if it is in a recession you're still making a 1.5 percent loss uh at um, you know, it's, well, just know if you're in the stock market, 1.5% gain, and if you're out of that, you're making a 7% loss, which is insane. Just saying that, it's madness. And if you don't even put it in an interest lo in interest bank account, which is most default, uh, you know, debit or any sort of normal current accounts with zero interest, they normally are losing a full 8.5% purely just off inflation. Imaginary, like obviously you don't see the value go down, but the value of your money is less each year. Um, and you may see it as a very small percent, but over the time it's, it's biting and eating away at your money. Now, moving on to the next couple of points because I don't want to barry on about the terribleness of current inflation. Yada, 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 yada. What can you do to fight it? Well, there's... The, one of the great things in this book as well, sorry, <laughs> in this book as well, is he talks about actually what assets are. So examples of assets. So he talks about, let's start with the easy ones. Robert likes real estate. So you can buy real estate. And when I say real estate, I don't mean you, you put a mortgage on it for you to own a home. That's not what he means at all. He means real estate to be able to buy and sell. So you do it up and then you sell it to make a profit or you buy it and you rent it out to be able to ca get the cash flow of that rent to pay the mortgage on the house. And then the value of the house increases and you're getting cash from the rent or you're just paying off the mortgage to be able to make the value of that house gain into you. You can sell it off uh, and then you can buy a bigger house, use that tax loophole of by buying a bigger house, you don't have to pay the current tax uh, on that house once you sell it, which is fantastic, which means you can just keep increasing the value of the house until you, you run out of any more expensive houses to buy, which is fantastic, you know, an incredible uh, loophole in the system. And then you can consider buying stocks. Stocks, much easier access nowadays than they used to be with trading two on two, uh, with Vanguard, with all of these platforms that allow you to do very minimal uh, amounts of money being spent on people making transaction fees and all of these horrible stock brokerage things that used to happen where you had to pay a broker to be able to do all this movement of money for you. Madness, just insane vanguard is the way forward if i was going to suggest anyone it's been around for so long and it's got a tiny percentage fee when it comes down to investments so please go ahead if you're into stocks or even bonds for that matter you can do that with vanguard as well or pensions for that matter as well on top of that you've also got intellectual property to be honest though i don't know many people who are going to be able to find intellectual property unless you're a scientist or someone who has access to new inventions, new ideas, new places, unless you're in Silicon Valley maybe or something on those lines, then it may be, why are you listening to me? You should be smart enough to be able to figure this out for yourself. <laughs> uh, and then there is, you know, IOUs, but they're like, who, who has an IOU nowadays? And there, there was also, uh, I think, a couple of others, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I don't think there was anything that was major that I'm missing there. There was a couple of, he does, he's got a little list within the book, um, but I don't think that there, the next point I wanna make is this, 
is one of the things that most people do is when it comes down to bills, they will pay their bills last. Pay your bills first, get them out of the way, and then make sure that once you've paid your bills, like when I mean bills, I mean like bills that you can't physically, like rent, for instance. Most people either have a house or they have rent. Now, if you were renting, most people consider that not smart. And they say it, and I hear this all the time, and it drives me absolutely friggin' nuts. You're throwing money away. No, you're not. You're buying freedom. <laughs> freedom from your parents, freedom from your family, freedom for you, freedom from the from for having personal space, freedom to be able to cancel that contract and move to a new place. When you have a mortgage, you are tied down for 20 to 30 years. You have to keep a job. You have to sell your soul to the system that you want to sell it to. This is madness, the amount of people I hear telling me that renting is for suckers. I hear that and see that on a regular basis. It is not. We need to start some sort of finance like lesson system at schools because when I hear that, I want to scream. It's absolute madness that people say that. It, it gen genuinely blows my mind. You have, if I hear that from somebody, I know they have zero to no finance knowledge. That means they haven't looked up any system. If I say to them what a dividend is, they have no frigging clue. If I say when they are paid for, they will have no clue. For those who don't know, dividends are paid quarterly by most companies. Um, and it's based off the amount of money they've made or lost during that period of time. They'll pay dividends whether they like it or not, but most of the time your dividends will be increased if they made more money, and if they made less money, those dividends will be less. It's based off a shareholder to share ratio. Nonetheless, we're not getting too technical here, and I'm having a little bit of a Taylor's tangent, as we say here, on this podcast, for those who didn't know. <laughs> but renting isn't for that. It provides you with freedom. And it allows you to be able to have your own space to be able to create these minding your own businesses. And therefore, you shouldn't consider that money wasted. You should consider it as a way for you to be able to have your own freedom. And you should say to yourself that that is a necessity, not something that's being thrown away. So another point made there. And on top of that, you've got your utilities, you've got your food, which you need to survive on, of course. And then you've also got stuff like, uh, I'm trying to think that's something that's really, oh yeah, uh, like poll tax or local council tax, stuff like that, stuff that you can't really get out of that you have to pay. But apart from that, those are bill essentials. Maybe you have a car and maybe you need to get to be able to drive to work. There you go, you've got your uh, transport bill transport bill as well for me because i can work remotely that doesn't really apply to me as much so there is a key point there so you've got your essential bills there pay them out the way then you've got what's left over now you can utilize it for assets and this is where we begin to get smart and be smart financially together now i'm this is a learning process for me as much as it is for you but what i've already, what i can say is i've already implemented it and been able to see some really nice results from it and by doing so, you can look at your money in a different way. You no longer see every paycheck as a way to just immediately go out and buy the thing that you want. You no longer just spend frivolously without thinking about it. What you do do is you become effective with your money. And instead of just buying the drinks, buying the alcohol, buy the, buying all the things every weekend, you've already moved your money into different accounts to the point where there's not, there is no money to spend or there's very little left owner in your main account to be able to spend that money. And if you're smart as well, you're also not, because you no longer see that money in the main account, you're psychologically less inclined to spend money. So what you do in this case is you buy your assets, so you send a monthly amount to your Vanguard account, You've got your assets now, you've got new stocks, or if you want to go buy some real estate, obviously you can't do that on a monthly basis, but what you can do is put it into a housing savings account. So you can send that money to a housing savings account. See, both both areas and both like can be done. And from here, you have an automatic transaction that you can't stop. But the, the routine, and knowing like it's a transaction, it's like paying for something. It's already gone from your account. You have no control over it. It's just gone and it's out of your mind. That money's not there anymore. You don't you don't have it. And that's really, that's something that Robert talks about in here as well. And uh, I also learned that from the 
book i will teach you to be rich which they should really rename rename that book i really hate the name of that book because he doesn't teach you how to be rich he teaches you the fundamentals of finance it should be called fi finance fundamentals is what i would love to rebrand that book but nonetheless it's a great point is that if you can remove your money into savings accounts so let's say you want to go on holiday you do a 10 percent account there and you chuck it into a savings account where because it's not long term, it's short term, you don't really need to worry about the interest. So you put it into like a one or two percent savings account and you can just know it's out of your main account and therefore the money is no longer available to you. And then you can do the same with other things and you start prioritizing things like oh, if you want a new car, if you want a new um, house, you, you put them into different accounts outside of your main account. And then your credit cards and sort of American Express cards or whatever you have you can then know that you shouldn't be using them because you don't have the money in the main account. Or if you're seriously struggling to limit yourself on the money you spend, you should be thinking to yourself, maybe I should snap these cards up and not have credit cards in the first place. And maybe that might be the psychological uh, break that you need to be able to take full control of your finances and really physically say to yourself, all I've got is a debit card and that debit card I'm going to keep it home away from me, physically out of my sight, so I can't spend from it as well. And that's also something that I've done. I don't carry my debit card on me anymore because, number one, it's also a security issue in the sense that if somebody gets hold of my debit card and they spend on it, it takes the bank a lot more time to be able to get my money back than if they steal my credit card. It's the bank's money, and therefore they get it back pretty quickly. <laughs> and so this is also another thing is you should be able to consider something. That's not something I've learned from Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That's just free advice right there. But Rich Dad, Poor Dad also talks about his utilization of his normal jobs. So he talks about Xerox. He talks about being in the Marines, talks about being... Uh, in just normal jobs as a salesman and he uses that time to be able to build his asset folder and if you're in that period of life which most of us are in that you know mid to late 20s uh, or in your early 30s you can utilize this time to be able to build your asset folder too now i'm not saying that if you're in your 40s that you're out of time it's not the case at all you can still build your asset folder it's just going to be a little bit more pressure on you and I think this is the really cool thing is I'm not saying this from a millionaire's or a billionaire's perspective. I'm just talking from a normal guy's perspective, starting from that same point who's going to be building alongside with you. And I think a lot of these YouTube, YouTube uh, little podcasts and YouTube videos is guys who've already done it. And it can be a little bit like, you you know, you feel a little bit daunting because you see this person who's done it successfully and implemented it. And I've done it in some ways, but on the very basic scale, you know, if you say that you've run for a year you know it's, you're a very beginner and it's the same with these finances i've financially become literate for the first year so i am still a beginner like yourselves and this is going to be fun to be able to go through but i thought i would talk about rich dad poor dad purely because of some of these points i think i've really scratched the surface because 30 minutes isn't really enough to be able to talk about some of these uh financial decisions but i've really talked about some of the most important points uh i also want to say that he talks, this is uh, actually, yeah, let's talk about this really. Poor dad's financial statement versus rich dad's financial statement. Poor dad's financial statement, he has income and he has expenses, but his asset column is smaller than his liabilities. While rich dad's statements, he has an income and he has expenses, but his expenses are smaller than his income. And his asset co column is bigger, much bigger than his liabilities. And this, this is really important. 20 years ago today, your scorecard, without a financial statement, you don't really know where you are in, the, in life's financial game. Like it or not, money tells the score of your game. And a financial statement is your scorecard. Banks want financial statements, income statements, and balance sheets to know how well you're scoring in your life's financial game. I love that he calls it a game because life is a video game. And if I, if I had my way, I'd love to see everyone's scorecards. Uh, you know, it, it, it would be fantastic to be able to have what Fallout 3 had. In the sense that you could have charismatic points, you could have intelligence points, you could have uh, gun-ho points, you could have uh, the ability to lockpick points. Life is like that. And this, what he talks about here in the financial game is exactly the same. It's a financial game. And you must understand the rules of the game to be able to play this game well. And I'm understanding the rules to a very basic level, but it's, you know, 
having a basic understanding of finances is 90% better than 90% of the population, it seems like, and their non-understanding and their secondary school level education of finances in the sense that most schools are training worker bees, which is what Robert talks about a lot, in the sense that we are drones to be sent out into the workforce rather than thinkers and entrepreneurs who are looking to be able to build uh, build businesses and mind your own business and to be able to build wealth. Now I've gone on for quite a long time here and I feel like I said I've only scratched the surface with Rich Dad Poor Dad but I hope I've given you a little taste, a little smattering of how good this book is and how much excitement I get from rereading this book over and over again. And I hope that you will take like the six quid it costs to buy it off Amazon, go read it yourself. And it's literally, uh, you know, I think, yeah, it's, it's like 300 pages, three, 350? Yeah, some, yeah, three, 350. And out of that 350, a lot of it is chapter summaries as well. So, you, you know, it's a lot less than that really. And it's got some really cool exercises that you can perform in there as well. Uh, I don't want to spoil those because they're for you to go do. And for you, to, for you, the listener, if you've made it this far, well done again, getting to the end. That's that's <laughs> You've got willpower and you may be one of the few that uh, have the patience to be able to make it. So I hope you've enjoyed this podcast and I, I really hope that you've got something from my tangents and my uh, nattering on about Rich Dad, Poor Dad. But as always, this has been a Tell Us, Tell Us podcast. This has been Chris Escorn. I've been your host, Chris Taylor. And as always, I hope to see you this time next week. Bye now.